Um, as Bill said, I'm, I'm a senior trainer for Mabo. Um, I've been with them for about 10 years. I want you to remember that figure, by the way, about 10 years, because in about five minutes' time, that's going to become quite important. Um, and as Bill kind of alluded to there, I'm also diagnosed autistic. And I want to start this talk with a question. But before I ask the question, um, I'm going to tell you a really quick story. And this happened to me roughly 18 months ago. Um, I was having a boys' night in. Uh, well, <laughs> I say there were, it was boys' night in. There were only two of us. Uh, us autistics aren't great at crowds. Um, <laughs> and we were watching a film. Um, and <laughs> I was talking to Tony France last night. And I'd love to claim that it was like the Temple Grand in biopic or some other autistic pioneer, but it wasn't. Um, and we were watching the film, and after a while, my friend said to me, Dave, are you aware of what you're doing? And for about the last 15 minutes, I had been sat there quietly rocking backwards and forwards. And I do it in a very, 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 very spe uh, specific position. And this is what's known in the autistic co uh, community as stimming. Um, and I've got quite a few different stims. I'm, I'm, you're more than welcome in the breaks to talk to me about it. More than happy to talk, to talk about it. But this is a particular stim that I do when I'm happy. Okay? So this brings me to the question. It basically makes the happy more happy. Okay? It makes me feel more happy. So if it makes me feel more happy, why don't I rock on trains? And what I want you to do in your tables in a second is I want you to have a little discussion on each table as to why I don't rock on trains. However, I'm going to caveat that with I don't want any facetious answers that it's because of the state of the rail system and <laughs> the delays and things like that. So I'm going to give you a few minutes on your tables. Let's just have a discussion about why, as an adult, I don't rock on trains. Over to you. Okay, folks, so I wonder if I can draw you back in, um, and I wonder if, uh, if there are any, any tables who would like to kind of make some suggestions as to why uh, I don't rock on trains. Um, I'm going to have to run around with the microphone again, so I've got some answers over here. Can I see? <laughs> um, it, so we were having a discussion how the train is already giving that sensation of movement. Okay. So it could then mean that you don't, wouldn't need to rock because the train's rocking. Interesting. I'm not going to answer it yet. <laughs> Any other ideas? Matt? Maybe a train's just not a happy place for you, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, possibly. <laughs> no, still not the reason. Uh, hi Dave, uh, we discussed the awareness around it. You're at home, happy, comfortable with your friend who knows about your uh, particular condition. Okay. On a train, very aware that it's starting to rock back and forward in front of members of the public who don't know you. All of a sudden, judgments start to be made, come out, make ah. you feel uncomfortable. Yeah, that's interesting. There's, there was one more. I'm going to take one more here. I said maybe you're just happy, but not more happy. <laughs> interesting. It's actually more to do with that, if, if I'm honest, and it's kind of more to do with the type of autism that I have. Um, I think the reality is that in 2015, diagnostic criteria changed for autism, so gone are things like Asperger's, and what remains is uh, um, ASD, so Autism Spectrum Disorder Level 1, Level 2, Level 3. And what I have is uh, ASD Level 1. And by the definitions of that, that means that I can live independently with uh, little or minimal support. Um, I can uh, care for myself, I can cook, I can wash myself. Um, what else? It's... But what people don't understand is that there are actually still a huge number of things that I really, really, really struggle with on a daily basis. And a lot of these things are sensory based are based on how I experience the world. So, for example, um, longitudinal time to me means nothing. I don't get it. 
Okay. Everything, if you've ever been um, on a course, um, one of my courses, everything in my life happened either five or ten years ago. Okay. When did I join Maybo? Could have been any time. No idea, actually. And in fact, I was doing a course several years ago, and somebody said to me, Dave, you did an awful lot of stuff five years ago. <laughs> was that just a really busy year for you? <laughs> so that sort of thing confuses me. Money. Don't get money at all. Money is a complete mystery to me. I will regularly get myself into all sorts of financial difficulties, not because I don't want to pay bills, but because I've forgotten, I've got distracted, I'm off thinking about something else. I also have um, major executive functioning problems, and that's something I'm going to come back to and talk about a little, a little bit later. And I think one of the problems is, actually, I'm not autistic enough. And it is about that perception. You know, as a grown adult on the commuter train, if I sit there suddenly rock and start rocking, what is the public's perception of that? Now, actually, as an autistic person, it would be brilliant because it would always mean that no one sits next to me. <laughs> but it is about that perception. And it's one of the reasons, in fact, why the type of autism I have is often referred to as the hidden disability. When I was first diagnosed, um, I looked into getting a social worker, um, perhaps even a PIP payment, to maybe get some help with a lot of these daily things that I struggle with. And what I was told, uh, well, first of all, the locality that I lived in then, um, when I got in touch with them about uh, getting a social worker, turned out that particular locality, which is a very big locality, didn't have a single autism social worker. And all I, they could offer me was an adult mental health social worker who admitted that she knew nothing about autism. Not a hell of a lot of help. Speaking to lots of other autistic people, um, and actually that social worker, they also expressed to me, the likelihood of you getting a PIP payment, zero. No chance. And I think that's probably one of the big problems. I'm just not autistic enough. And one of, when Bill asked me to do this talk, one of the other things that I wanted to link it to was neuro, neurodiversity and thinking about it from a training perspective. Part of the problem, I think, is the public's perception of what that autistic spectrum actually looks like. And I can't constantly come across comments from neurotypical people. The classic one is, we're all a bit autistic, aren't we? No, you're not. <laughs> I was born autistic and I will die autistic. It's not something that you can kind of dip in and out of. And realistically, but actually on a, on a slightly lighter note, there are some really interesting theories out there that are saying that actually we're, we are human 2.0. So effectively, we're X-Men. Now, I've spent most of my adult life working in adult social care. And it was drummed into me from a very, 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 from day one, in fact, one of my old mentors is here, you never say that somebody is a schizophrenic, for, ex for example, because what you're doing is defining them as that condition. Now, actually, in the autistic community, it's slightly different. I am an autistic, because actually, it does permeate every facet of who I am as an individual, because it impacts on my life so dramatically. And I just wanted to run through some of the sorts of sensory issues that I uh, experience. So sensory processing issues around sound, light, um, touch. Um, so for example, if you all ask me questions at the same time, because of my auditory filtering problems, I can't filter out those those voices. So all I actually hear is uh, just a wall of sound. And I think often for neurotypical people, that's quite difficult to understand. And I came across a really interesting um, cartoon, which I think just kind of sums it up. I'll just give you a second to read that. And this bit here, that is exactly what it's like for most autistic people. You know, one of my stock phrases throughout a, a day's training, for example, is too many voices, because I can't differentiate from them. I also have an ongoing joke with Bill and 
Steve. Um, one of the reasons that I regularly have very shaggy hair is the only time I will get my hair cut is when Bill or Steve eventually says to me, Dave, please get your hair cut. And the reason for that is two of my sensory issues are, I hate people touching my head. I can touch my head, but if you touch my head, it feels like you're sticking pins in my head. It's absolutely horrendous. And I also hate people in very close proximity behind me. Um, Rather unsurprisingly, I go to the same hairdressers every single time, and the same person cuts my hair every single time. And in fact, the last time I was there, and they know I'm autistic, um, the lady who cuts my hair leant round and said, Dave, you can breathe. Because apparently I'd been sat there gripping the chair, holding my breath, because I find it so traumatic because of those sensory issues. Bill recently asked me uh, to make some videos around my uh, perception of my autism. And I know it's a fairly stock phrase, but I, I just always think it's so important to remember it. You know, if you've met one autistic person, you've met one autistic person, because we are all so utterly unique and individual. Um, and one of the key videos that I wanted to uh, talk to him about, and in fact, sorry, and this is the essence of neurodiversity, actually. Um, one of the key things that I wanted to talk about was uh, executive functioning, which is an area that I have huge issues with. Now, I'm not going to go into massive, massive detail around this. Um, and in fact, I'm making a video on it anyway. Um, but for those of you who aren't familiar with executive functioning, I haven't seen that slide rotate. That's quite cool. So it falls into, and broadly speaking, and it kind of varies depending on where you go and um, which psychologist you speak to, um, broadly speaking, it breaks down into um, eight categories. So working memory, our ability to hold information while performing a task. Flexible thinking, great one for autistics, this, uh, because we tend to have very rigid mindsets. So it's our ability to initiate, for example, a plan B, okay? And, uh, and in fact, actually, if you speak to Bill about this, when Mabo uh, did the first piece of work around the presentations that you now use, who was the last person in the company to adopt that? Because it was change, and I, it, was, it required me to be quite flexible in my thinking, and I fought against it for a long time. I now would not be without it, I have to say. Technically, I have to say that. <laughs> Emotional control kind of does what it says on the tin. Inhibitory control, so our ability to kind of think before we act. Again, this is very often a very big problem for a lot of autistic people. Um, you, it is very common with uh, functioning adult autistics that we have a very, very small group of friends. And a lot of the time, that is due to our inhibitory control. We say completely the wrong things. And those relationships tend to break down. Yeah. I would probably say, and by the way, I'm not looking for a sympathy vote here, but I would probably say, in reality, I only have two friends. And actually, I'm okay with that. Sustained attention. <laughs> Steve will tell you about my, my levels of sustained attention. In fact, we were talking about it this morning. So, you know, it, that's our ability to focus on a task, even if the task is boring. But again, I just get distracted, and I'm off thinking about something else. Task initiation. So how we actually build that roadmap for that task and get going on it. And planning an organization. Um, and I have to say, if you want to get an idea of my deficits of planning and, uh, and organization, um, speak to Nicola or Lisa in the office. They will tell you my organizational skills are zero. And finally, self-monitoring. So getting that bird's eye picture of our progress and just seeing how we're moving forward. Now, the problem with executive functioning is it, 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 it impacts on every aspect of daily living constantly. And I was going to talk through this, but I actually want you to have a think about this. We're, for a lot of us autistic people, and I include myself in this, if you ask us open-ended questions, we really struggle with them. And the example I was going to use is if you say to me, Dave, clean the house, I'm, I'm kind of lost, actually. And I just want you to have a little think, just a quick two-minute discussion. Thinking about these executive functioning areas, how many of them impact on a task like cleaning the house? 
So I'm just going to give you two minutes in your groups, just to, on this table, just to have a little discussion about that and see how many of these you think impact on a task like cleaning your house. Okay, folks. So, would anyone on any of the tables like to kind of take a stab at this? All of them? <laughs> what did everyone else think? Yeah, that's, that's the reality. It, Im it impacts on every single one of these. Um, so, for example, think simple things like um, the uh, working memory. If I get distracted, I'm not, I won't remember what I've actually meant to be doing. So the dishes pile up and up and up. Um, task initiation. And actually, this is a really important one. So just actually knowing where to begin with the task. And it's interesting, when I'm uh, delivering training, one of the, the ways I explain that to people is at the end of the course, um, you know, I'll have like your projector, laptop, pens, bits and pieces on the table. And what I will try and do is I will actually try and clear all of that simultaneously because I'm not coming up with how to initiate that task. And I actually have to say to myself, Dave, executive functioning, do one thing at a time. For you, that's an automatic process, whereas for somebody like me, it's actually really difficult. And it's often seen as procrastination. Um, in fact, just ask my ex-wife that. Um, <laughs> and it's not at all. It can actually be incredibly overwhelming. And that can actually cause us major anxiety, which is something, again, I'm going to talk about. So what is this spectrum that's always referred to? Um, and I think one of the most important concepts to understand is that a lot of the time what, we're, what people are referring to is about somebody's functionality. And in fact, in the autistic community, there's a huge movement out there of people who really are very anti these functional labels like high and low functioning and are really fighting against them. I may appear functioning, but perhaps what I am better at than a lot of my fellow uh, autistics is masking it. I am better at fitting into a neurotypical world. Because you have to remember, th this world is not designed for us autistic people. It's designed for you neurotypical people. And actually, as a human being, I still want to fit in. You know, it's, I want to be part of society. And I think this links to the public's um, perception of that linear model for uh, the autism spectrum. But I think if we professionals don't dispel, um, you know, dispel this myth of a linear model, then what happens is we end up with this... Oh, by the way, sorry, I just wanted to point out, have any of you come across the website The Aspergian? For those who work in this field, it's a fabulous resource, really, really interesting. Um, and there's a great article that's, that's flying around the autistic community. It was written uh, beginning of this year by uh, C.L. Lynch. It's a spectrum doesn't mean what you think. It's a brilliant article. And I've got to be honest, I'm stealing directly for this. What happens if we, if we maintain that uh, linear model is we get into a situation where autism looks a little bit like this. So a little quirky, definitely autistic, or tragic autistic. Now, I'm not a little quirky or a tragic autistic, although I've got to be honest with you, Steve Hunt will often refer to me as just tragic. <laughs> <laughs> and I think this is the general population's perception, and it's, and it's a real problem. A major part of most autistic people's life experience is very heightened levels of anxiety. And I was fascinated, Paola, when you were talking in, in your talk about you know, how we see a diagnosis, but we don't necessarily see a lot of the things that are going around that. And for most autistic people, our anxiety levels are significantly higher. We are kind of almost in a permanent fight or flight state. And that has a huge impact. Um, people often ask me on courses, how do I stand up here, or, or talks, how do I stand up here with my heightened anxiety levels and do this? Well, actually, and I'm often reminded of uh, Sarah Hendricks, uh, one of Sarah Hendricks' uh, great talks, where she talks about, uh, who's a fellow autistic, who talks about the links between autism and anxiety. And she tries to explain uh, to another conference that, actually, I'm not interacting with you here. I'm talking at you. Yeah? 
And I've got to be honest with you, and Bill knows this, I dread these conferences every single year. Dread them. Not because of the content. The content's incredible. Bill always gets fantastic keynote speakers. The problem is, I've then got to interact with you lot out there. And for me, that's a major problem. Like a lot of autistics, small talk, I don't get it. Um, and in fact, if you go back a couple of years to these conferences, um, <laughs> here I meet lots of clients that I haven't maybe met for a year or two. They walk up to me, and what's the first thing they say? Dave, how are you? That is the worst question you can ask an autistic. A couple of years ago when I was um, splitting up, by the way, I talk about my wife a lot. We're still very good friends. Um, but a couple of years ago when I was splitting up with my wife, um, I came to this conference and um, I think it was Martin. Where's Martin? Hello, mate. He walked up to me and he said, Dave, how are you? And I went, well, I'm splitting up with my wife. I'm probably going to lose the house. And what Martin really wanted me to say was, I'm great, how are you? <laughs> but because of my literalness, I don't really get that. <laughs> and it causes all sorts of problems. And that literalness um, can cause so many more issues for autistic people than you understand. Because what it's doing is it's triggering even more anxiety. I don't want to sound like I'm turning into some sort of um, preacher and saying, you know, us and them, neurotypical and autistic, atypical. But it does have a really big impact because actually we want acceptance. The point I'm trying to make is neurodiversity only really works if people don't perceive our behaviours as weird. Um, I recently was moving house. Now, for most people, moving house is a really traumatic experience. For an autistic person, concept of change, ah! and also my house is my safe space. When I have finished a day at work and I get home and close the door, I am closing the door on the neurotypical world and I can go, oh, my space. So moving house for an autistic person is hugely traumatic. And <laughs> it was because it was so traumatic and causing me so much anxiety, my behaviours were becoming a lot more pronounced. And my brother, bless him, um, had to, he didn't tell me until afterwards, but had to take the removal men outside in private and explain to them, look, my brother's autistic, he's probably going to behave in a very weird way, um, just so that you're aware. Now, I was actually quite grateful for, to him for doing that, but the point here is... Why should I have to change or modify my behaviours when I'm in the neurotypical world? Why can't I rock on a train? I know that I'm hopefully in a room full of people who embrace neurodiversity, but the problem is I constantly come along frontline staff who work in the sector who really struggle with this idea. I was delivering a course about six months ago up north and I was doing a little mini autism uh, masterclass. And a learning disability healthcare assistant, phenomenally experienced, um, 25 years of experience, lovely, lovely guy, asked me a really fascinating question. And this kind of sums up a little, to a certain extent what I'm talking about. The question he asked me was, if you could take the blue pill, would you? Now, for those of you that aren't sure about that reference, it's a reference to The Matrix. Um, but what he was really asking me was, if I could take a pill to cure my autism, would I? And I found that actually initially quite a confusing <coughs> question. Because the problem is, much like I said earlier, I was born autistic, I'm going to die autistic. I do not understand what it means to have a neurotypical existence. So why would I want to change? And I'm constantly amused when I meet people for the first time and I say to them, you know, I, I tell them I'm autistic, and their first instant reaction is, oh, I'm sorry. Why? Remember, we're human 2.0. And in fact, there's a really big movement in America um, that has kind of hijacked um, applied behaviour analysis and turned it into almost Pavlovian operant conditioning um, to 
train autistics to do things like have quiet hands. This really irritates us. And what they're talking about there is a very common autistic stim is hand flapping. So what they mean by quiet hands is don't stim. Don't emotionally express yourself. Look more neurotypical. Look more normal. I find that quite frightening. Now, I don't want you to kind of think that I'm some neurodiversity urban gorilla here trying to, you know, infiltrate your minds. But I do think that it's so important from a neurodiversity, but also from a training perspective, that actually we're kind of breaking this down. Why, should, why do I have to be more normal? Why can't I emotionally express myself? And how can frontline workers possibly um, embrace neurodiversity is if all they see are behaviours that are outside of their norm. Very difficult. Here in the UK, we've got some amazing organisations uh, working in the field. Uh, National Autistic Society. Um, in fact, you've only got to go to Build's website um, to see the fantastic, especially this brilliant word cloud, the fantastic work that they've been doing since 1971 in terms of inclusion and, and you know, um, promoting and enabling people. So effectively, until we get a little bit further down the road, I'm still not going to rock on trains because it is that public perception. And I like this idea, you know, and I think it's something I want you to take away. So-called mild autism doesn't mean one experiences autism mildly. It means you experience my autism mildly. And I think for me that's an incredibly important concept. And for a lot of the people that you support who work in this field, you have no idea how hard it has been for those individuals to get to that point. I want to finish this talk with a question again. It's not a question that I think we can answer, but it's something that I really want you to take away from today because it's, it's kind of a, the essence of these conferences. So my question to you is, how are you, as care providers, going to incorporate neurodiv neurodiversity into your training? You've probably, you've probably all heard, you know, the government has uh, instructed that every single person in care settings must have autism training. But again, let's stop and think. You, hang on, what sort of training is it? Is it training by experience or is it training from a book? So I don't think we can answer this question here, but I do want you to take it away into your rel um, rel uh, respective organisations and really just think about it. Are we actually embracing neurodiversity? And if not, how can we? Now, I have to be honest with you. Um, unlike uh, some of my colleagues like Tony and Paola, um, I'm relatively new to public speaking. Um, and it didn't dawn on me to put my contact details up there. But I am available for children's parties and things like that. <laughs> So I hope it's given you a little insight, and I hope it's given you a good question to take away with you. Um, and all I want to say is uh, thanks for listening to me blathering on, and have you got any questions? Yeah, all right, Dave. <clears throat> Just looking at you, and obviously I've worked with you in the past, and I, I had no idea we had this conversation you know, several months back. Um, on a personal level, Something that people occasionally talked about in adulthood, you know, where they... You, you said something to me, although you didn't get your diagnosis till later on, you'd always known. And that's a conversation I've had with other people, and I'm, I'm sure it's a personal answer, but I'd like to have your sort of view on this. Obviously, you know, a lot of people will say, in, you know, when you're younger, it can, helping support in place, school, education, I know you're an academic achiever. What are the advantages of getting a diagnosis as an adult? Is it sanitive? Do you think there are pros and cons? What, what would you say to someone who's saying, look, you know, I'm 35 and I think, is it, what's the pros and cons of getting a diagnosis? Do you think it's a positive? How has it helped you getting that diagnosis? That is a really, really interesting question. Um, I think 
The reality is, when I decided to get an official diagnosis, um, I think I was roughly about 42, um, I thought I knew who I was. I thought at, at, at that age, I built a picture of who I am as an individual. Now, interestingly, when you get that diagnosis, you actually go through a bit of a, ber a bereavement process. Because suddenly you have to rethink who you are as an individual. And that has a really profound impact. I am still incredibly glad I did get the diagnosis um, because I, I constantly have these eureka moments where I look back over my life and I suddenly go, that explains that bit. And that's really powerful and, in, uh, powerful and it's very enabling actually. Um, so for me, and, and uh, uh, my experience of talking to other autistic uh, people who are diagnosed late in life on things like Reddit, which is I, I, a really good uh, resource, you've got to be relatively uh, able to, uh, to filter stuff out, but it's, it's a pretty good resource. And speaking to other fellow autistics who are diagnosed late, um, it seems to be a very common theme that you do go through this bereavement process, but the kind of end result and being able to have all of these eureka moments makes it totally worthwhile. So, any other questions, folks? Can I just make a really quick point? I know I said that um, that small talk bit I really struggle with. Please do feel free in the breaks, though, to come and talk to me. <laughs> Thank you again, folks. I'm going to hand back to Bill.